Africa, and uh, this is the first uh, roundtable that uh, we have on, uh, on the issue of uh, pandemics. So I let uh, Simon uh, uh, ignite the discussion. Very good. So thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I want to introduce our, our um, panelists, and there'll be some others who will um, but uh, if, in fact, let me just call on you and, and, and let you introduce your, yourself, starting with uh, Lona. Yes, hi, my name is Lone Simonsen. I'm a professor here in, uh, at the University in Denmark. I've been in the US for many years, but I'm here now. I worked on pandemics for 30 years, and this year I spent my entire time working on COVID and advising the government and, the, and being on the press and everything. So I have nothing on my mind right now, so it's a good time. <laughs> Jürgen. I'm delighted. Uh, I, I live in a strange country called Sweden, uh, which seems to follow another route than other countries. Uh, I'm a professor of economics. I'm a mathematician by training and working on game theory, including evolutionary game theory, population dynamics, and stuff like that. And now I've been working on modeling together with Simon and his uh, lab uh, of uh, epidemiological models, including face masks and so on. I've also worked with a mathematician in France uh, on optimal control of epidemics, uh, waves, and things like that. So I'm an applied mathematician economist, you could call me, game theorist. Marino, who unfortunately- uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot join with the camera. It's that, uh, it doesn't work, and I don't know why <laughs> it usually works. So I am uh, now professor emeritus of ecology at the Politecnico di Milano, Milano, Italy. I have been trained as a, wow, well, as an electronic engineer, but let me say like as a mathematical model, basically. But then I started working in uh, ecological modeling 40 years ago. I'm very much interested in uh, disease ecology in the past, uh, let's say, 15, 20 years. And uh, uh, OK, together with a group of other people, I have developed, the, I think, that the first uh, spatial model for COVID-19 in Italy. So I'm very much interested in the round table. Josh. I'm Joshua Weitz, Professor of Biological Sciences at Georgia Tech, where I usually work on virus microbe dynamics of, you know, again, viruses of the small. We've also worked over many years on ecological modeling, epi modeling, going back to uh, Ebola virus disease, uh, doing some work in response there. And this past year have been Myself and my team critically involved in many aspects of COVID-19 modeling, uh, from estimating uh, or not, and, and then going on to risk, as well as predictive models, forecasting models, and also with respect to Georgia Tech's implementation of a saliva-based testing program, and essentially testing as mitigation. Delighted to be here. Mercedes. Hello, everybody. So I'm uh, at the University of Chicago, and uh, I'm a theoretical ecologist working on uh, infectious diseases, mostly population dynamics, the influence of uh, climate, variability and change, environmental change, and also the interplay of evolution and ecology. Scott. I just took a mouthful of cereal because <clears throat> I've been on Zoom for the last three hours. Um, so I'm at uh, Columbia University. I'm an economist. Um, I work on a variety of issues. I have worked on infectious diseases, mainly looking at um, disease eradication as um, a kind of extreme form of um, a situation which we, we rely on countries to cooperate to address the issue. Uh, the other end of that spectrum is when you have the emergence of a new disease. Th those two are kind of... Um, at, at two ends of a, of a long spectrum on infectious diseases, eradication and the emergence of a new disease. And obviously COVID is in that category. And one thing we're observing is that the international system is not responding in a very helpful way to COVID. Um, we're entering a new era now with vaccine distribution, which I think is gonna be the most critical one for the international perspective. But that's, that's the aspect that I'm more interested in. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, um... Wilfred Nadifan will not be able to join us today. Unfortunately, he had a death in his family. Um, I'm, I expect Ramanan Lakshman Orion to join us. I don't see him yet. If, if you're there and I don't, it's just that I don't see you, Ramanan, please speak up. But I, otherwise, I suspect he'll be joining us a little bit late. 
All right, there, there are many topics that we could address and we've only got uh, 55 minutes to do it in, but I, I'd like to begin with uh, something that we're, uh, that's right at the core of dealing with COVID and that we're all interested in, um, which is the trade-offs between um, controlling the disease and making sure that uh, we minimize the number in the hospital and the economic costs to society. Uh, and I don't want to approach that from a theoretical point of view at the beginning. I want to uh, take a, a case study because there are a number of statements that are out there, a number of differences in the way governments have approached it. There's something called the Great Barrington Declaration that's been signed on by a, a, a number of libertarian economists and, and, and a few uh, public health people. Um, but the, the, the most striking difference is the uh, um, is the Swedish policy, which differs, for example, from uh, other Nordic countries and to how they've approached, and, and most other countries, uh, as to how they've opposed the disease, uh, appearing to rely to a large extent on the development of herd immunity by people getting, getting sick. Uh, I'm, I, I, I oversimplify the strategy, but that's also been suggested or was suggested early on in the UK, but was quickly reversed uh, after an outcry. And, and I'd like to turn first to you, Jürgen, since it's a Swedish strategy and you're the Swede on the panel, uh, to, to tell us a, a little bit about the strategy and what you think about it. And then I'll ask uh, Lona to go next, uh, since she does know Anders Tegno. You're muted, I think. We can't hear you at all. OK, I'm sorry. So uh, I'm not a specialist on... on um... On, on corona or, or viruses, but I have looked at this from a modeling viewpoint and, and also taking part in the debate in Sweden. Uh, the early, it earliest, it was said by Anders Tegnell and also other people um, it, it, that actually herd immunity was what they were thinking of. Uh, it was said that it is just as well to let it develop like that we cannot do much about it and then try to mild on the consequences and protect the, the the fragile and the old they have later on denied that actually but this has been documented so journalists know about it and many in the public knows about it so they they, they changed the, they, they, they changed what they said but they did this and then I would also like to connect to this you said about libertarianism because it's very well known in economics that there is you know uh, an idea of that the market will solve problems. Uh, Adam Smith, the invisible hand, you know, if everybody thinks of him or herself and does it in a rational and systematic way, that will benefit everybody. It leads to, you know, a good state of society, Pareto efficient allocation, we call it. Now, it's also well known that that only holds under extremely strong conditions, which are so strong So many economists say that it is it will not happen. And one of the conditions is that there is no externality, as we call it. There's no effect of what I'm doing on anybody else. I'm only acting through the market. Now, this is certainly not the case with an epidemic. So if I take measures to protect others or myself, that will have an effect on others. It might be that there is a cost for me to, you know, to take some protective measures, but I will use them too little if I would be thinking of myself only, because I don't take into account then the external effect on others that I protect others by doing this thing. Now, this is very well known, and it's just embarrassing to hear the Swedish authorities talk, and understand that in particular, as if they haven't taken class this class of, uh, of basic you know, social science, uh, so that uh, uh, they kind of neglect. So they can say things like this, well, you can wear a face mask if you like. And, and then, but people then in Sweden, the attitude is that that is a sign of weakness. So I know of kids who have been ridiculed and scorned by other kids in school if they wear a face mask. They don't dare to do it because it's considered to be a sign of weakness or that you are not understanding the thing. So it's a, I think there is a very, very difficult situation in Sweden. And one of the misses they have, mistakes they have made is you cannot rely on individual decision in such a situation. It is a common problem. It's a public, uh, public bad uh, situation. And it's a positive externality of measures that we take as individuals. And therefore we have to encourage that. And they don't. I think it's a major mistake. So let me, um, thank you. Um, and and uh, if I understand from the latest news, um, uh, when the Swedish strategy uh, implemented initially, there were a lot of deaths, but many of them in, in nursing homes. Yes. Uh, the, the numbers then went down, but now they've shot up dramatically and there's a big debate as, um, as, as to what to do in, in Sweden. That's um, correct. 
can I fill in with one little thing there that it was believed by Tegnell that since it was relatively widespread the disease in the spring, it would not be necessary with measures in the fall uh, because there would be some level of herd immunity. So he actually, they actually relaxed the conditions in the late uh, summer. And uh, then it turned out he was wrong. Yeah, so Lona, could you um, give us the perspective from, from Denmark on, on, on what the Swedes are doing? <laughs> Yeah, you're you're muted. Yeah, we can't hear a word you're saying. Hello, sorry about that. Yes, yeah. so our perspective is geographically, we're sitting right on the other side of uh, Sweden, and we are very jealous. In Sweden, they live free lives. They have, wear no masks. They uh, they get around. They socialize in restaurants, and we have had the lockdowns that are more typical of uh, the rest of Europe and the United States. So let me uh, say something because I'm, I will reveal that I'm actually think that, and this is to the economists on this uh, conference here, that I think actually that Sweden came up with something that was sustainable, a sustainable strategy, which they brought in too late. And then it, um, in the end, they uh, deferred, they, they deviated from it. And that's why we are, they're having a big problem now. But if you look in the mean, in, in the middle sp space, after they had a disastrous beginning, they responded too late. They came in only in the end of March with some strong measures such as closing large uh, gatherings and, uh, and to, to be, be a bit more careful about the elderly. And then you see their uh, curve of mortality swing around and they had a sustained epidemic control between May and September. And this might be the most misunderstood fact in the, in the history of this pandemic. But this is the truth. So my point is that if they had introduced that strategy earlier, at the time we in Denmark shut down our whole country, we would have had a sustainable uh, epidemic situation there that, and they would have avoided all their deaths in the elder sector. And, and so in, in effect, they're really showing us the way to, if the vaccines didn't work, maybe the Swedes are onto something here. And I, I am missing that debate and that angle here. I wanna say that there's a, um, in the end of the day, they, they ended up uh, just like you said, Jörn, they actually said, okay, it's going very well. They were the poster child of Europe then with the lowest infection rate in Europe and uh, despite all their openness and they said, fine, let's open up the big conference, uh, the big meetings and they went from 50 uh, uh, up to 300 and what happens? Fall happened and schools happened and this happened and all of a sudden there's, there's, they're in a major bad situation right now. But I don't think that has anything to do with the strategy that, that brought them safely through the, uh, from, from March, uh, from May to uh, September. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to stand up for Anna's signal. I think they were lucky, but they're definitely onto something. So um, Lona, you were one of those who um, wrote in opposition to the Great Barrington Declaration. Yes. What's the difference between the Swedish strategy and the Great Barrington? recommendation. Uh, the, the Great Barrington Declaration is all about uh, we should just uh, uh, put the old people in a closet on a basement somewhere and then the, let the rest of us rip through this epidemic. It's nothing uh, severe. I have so many reasons for, for objecting to that. That's not even funny. And if you notice the people who signed that declaration, they're, they're not the infectious disease epidemiologists that you usually see in this field. They all signed something called the John Snow Memorandum. And I'm not a fan of signing things like that, but I actually signed this one because I think it's a pretty important discussion to have and, and to show that we were many people who thought differently about it. I don't think this has anything to do with Sweden, by the way. Okay. Josh, you've um, thought a lot about these sorts of issues and uh, various strategies. Um, maybe you can weigh in on this. Yeah, so I'll say a couple of comments here because we are talking about dichotomies. And I think one of the things that's been problematic from the beginning is the option of dichotomies. And I think there's been a, a false uh, dichotomous thinking from the outset. When all you have is a lockdown, maybe the only alternative is open it all up. But why are those the only two options at play? And so one of the things, if we go back to the sort of initial, the Swedish case, I mean, I'm, look, if you look at the daily mortality, compare it to Denmark or to uh, Norway or to Finland, I mean, we're talking 10, depending on which country, 10, in some cases, more fold higher. So obviously there's something that went very wrong there, especially with vulnerable people, but still had, these were people's parents and grandparents and, and loved ones and so on. 
where we've tried to make an impact is to try to both inform and also address alternative strategies. And the one that we've tried to work on both in theory but in practice is testing as a form of mitigation. And particularly now, one of the big worries I have is that we're entering this vaccine phase where I think there's a sense, well, good thing is on the way, and it is, it's incredibly good. But we are also at a period in the United States where there's tremendous amount of spread. There's been a resurgence, we're getting 3000 fatalities a day at this point in the United States a day. And that doesn't seem like it will stop soon, in part because of Thanksgiving and meetings there, but also because we haven't invested in universal mass wearing and as virus testing as a form of mitigation. At Tech, we ended up like UIUC, like many other places, making this investment. That needs to then transition to the next level, which is state and national level using it as part of an intervention policy. And I'll just have one last comment there, which is, you know, there's this sort of uh, crazy Trumpian comment about we have so many cases because we test so much. But I want to flip that around and basically say that in the near term, more testing will lead to more documented cases, but fewer actual cases in the long term. And we've seen in practice here at Tech, the identification early of outbreaks means that we can actually stop chains of transmission before they start. And so when I hear this sort of options, I'd like us to on this panel at least open the idea there are more options. It's not lockdown or open all up. There's lots of ways to be more targeted uh, in, in productive sense. I hope we get to some of that. Okay, um, are, are, are others, I don't wanna put anybody on the spot because I, I called on the people that I know have been working on these things, but Marino, Mercedes, Scott, uh, I wonder if, if uh, any of you have any thoughts that you'd like to share on this. Yes. Uh, I, I, see, I see Ramanan's joined us now too. Uh, and, uh, I joy. I used your link, Simon. I wasn't able to make it work with mine. Well, um, to just, just, just to let Ramana know what we're discussing, we're talking about um, herd immunity strategies, the Swedish strategy, uh, the Great Barrington Declaration, and the trade-offs in general between uh, minimizing the number of cases and possible damage to the uh, economy. So go ahead. Scott, were you, were you about to... Uh, yeah, can, can, well, can I have a word, uh, Simon? No, oh, Marino, okay, I'm sorry, yes, go ahead. No, well, you, you know, uh, there are uh, different containment measures that you can implement, and you know, I'm not an economist, but according to my idea, they have different uh, costs. So, for instance, uh, wearing a mask or, a, you know, protection is very inexpensive. And let me say, because Italy was the first hip uh, country in Europe, that it is incredible that, uh, you know, that this very simple containment measure were not implemented from the very beginning. They are very expensive. And Europe had one month time to prepare, to get ready. Because, you know, uh, the, the first documented case in Italy was the end of February, no, 21 February. And uh, we already know, we already, uh, we, we had already uh, an idea of what was going on in China. And therefore we had one month. And, uh, you know, masks are really inexpensive. And, okay. Now, of course, um, if you stop, uh, if you stop traveling, uh, that's much more costly. Uh, he, so my, my idea that really Europe was missing an, an opportunity. And uh, so you have to go into lockdown now again, and Italy is now in lockdown, my, especially my, my region, Lombardy, where I live, Milano, awful condition. And uh, that is due to the fact that people, uh, you know, were communicated the wrong message that everything was over. That uh, and then, that, that's the, the, the sure truth. And according to me, there are uh, diff, diff, the, the different options have really very, very, very different costs. Uh, and they, um, you know, and well, we, we, we conducted a, a study of that. So, uh, you know, reducing mobility cannot, can never bring or not below one. Reducing transmission rates, it can, 
isolation and testing is more costly, of course, than uh, wearing an inexpensive mask, an expensive face cover. Uh, and it is more effective if you can isolate people, identify and isolate. That's, uh, that's my, my idea. Can I, can I make a few? Yeah, go ahead, Bruce, please. So, so yes, um, some very uh, rapid comments. Uh, one of the, I think, behind perhaps some of the people who signed that declaration and do some modeling of disease, there is an interesting issue that I think uh, has to be resolved is that, you know, we have a poor sense of the levels of herd immunity that must be reached. And part of the problem there is with the estimates uh, of how the, the heterogeneity in susceptibility uh, modifies R0. And I think there was very interesting work by Gabriela Gomez and her kinds of models in epidemiology, they are worth looking at. I think it's a beginning in that direction, but it is a problem. How do we deal with that heterogeneity and what does it mean for the, for the level of herd immunity? And I think that that may have perhaps misled some people to think that that, that level should, was lower. Uh, I don't know, because I think there is tremendous uncertainty on that number. Second comment, uh, Lon mentioned, uh, the May to September reduction. I think uh, a big elephant in the room for COVID is the role of seasonality uh, and the role of climate factors uh, influ through many, many routes, not just direct effects on the virus, but also on behavior. And uh, there is a paper by Javier Rodo and uh, while well, I'm in it, but uh, mainly by them, uh, showing uh, clear effects of, of seasonal climate uh, which, by the way, previous uh, modeling said should not have an effect given the very large number of susceptibles. Uh, that is not the picture, and I think the mean field models are, are um, sending us in the wrong direction. Marino mentioned travel, and my last comment is that I think they have handled travel at the very interesting scale, the large scale, right, of travel between cities. Uh, there is a question of movement at the, the micro scales, and uh, I think that is a much more difficult issue. Good, uh, Scott. Could, could I just, if, I, sorry, Simon, could I, a very brief comment to Mercedes, uh, first point, if I just may say that, one thing. If yeah, for, sure. Uh, you talked about uh, the, the uh, heterogeneity, uh, and that is, I think, also super important. And I just want to alert you that there is a science article, recent one, by Tom Britton, a Swedish mathematical biologist, uh, published in science. I, I have seen the paper, yes. Tom Britton published this. The paper by Gabriela Gomez had been out in the archives for a while and she has been modeling these kinds of things. So yes, they are in the same direction and I think people should look at it. I, I would recommend young people here uh, who are interested in doing work, you know, modeling. This is one aspect I think would be need a lot of more work. I agree. Go on. Yeah, thanks so much. Great, great uh, comments from everyone. So I want to go back to uh, Jorgen Weibel's uh, introduction. I think it's really important for epidemiologists to understand and integrate human behavior uh, into their models. Um, and basically where he was starting off was this, uh, what we would call a kind of a competitive equilibrium when people are acting uh, individually. Um, they're Basically, they're going to be inclined more or less uh, when you bring when you bring richness of human behavior into account, it gets get a little complicated. But they're going to be um, ignoring a big part of the effect of their own choices and actions on others. So the the result of all that is that you would expect uh, in any society that there would be too little social protection. Um, and that's completely to be expected. And that's why we have public health policies. And that's why there's a conflict inherent in this um, uh, situation between the public and the private. And I think that's really important to understand because when, if, if people are asked to take measures, we need to understand that th there's a reason why they wouldn't do that on their own. And what I would say about the policies we've adopted is they haven't always understood the motivations that are coming from individuals. Now, this gets super complicated because we have a lot of um, uh, very bizarre things going on with human behavior. I think we're gonna get to probably later uh, in the session uh, about social norms, but also about beliefs um, 
and so on. I hope we get to that later. But even leaving that out, uh, what you actually need if you really want to change that outcome is you need to change the incentives people are facing. And one thing I've noticed is there's been a disconnect between a lot of the economic policies that have been adopted. And this goes back to your original question, uh, Simon, about how to uh, trade off control of the pandemic with uh, you know, maintenance of, a, of a economic function. Uh, for example, asking people um, to stay home while at the same time not compensating them for a loss of income from work. There are interventions that you can take from the point of view of public policy that would reinforce the public health policy. So these two things have to be synchronized. And where we've seen a lot of problems is because there has not been this uh, synchronization. They've been out of step. And then there's this tension and people are upset and they're pointing fingers and they're fabricating all sorts of um, uh, myths as well. Uh, but that, that I think what I'm trying to get to is that that tension is, is to be expected. And that's why those policies need to be um, uh, integrated. Uh, I could also add in dynamic sense, I think this also, um, we should not be surprised that there would be waves uh, and that uh, public policy could even enhance or amplify the waves. Thanks. Thank you. But before I uh, go on to the, uh, to the to the other panelists, I, I just want to say that <laughs> Scott implied correctly that I had a list of about ten questions I was going to address. We'll be lucky to get through two today, but that's okay because I think that this uh, this particular issue lays bare a lot of uh, questions and things I talked about on Monday in my lecture, which was the importance of looking at things like social norms and public goods problems. Um, and if we, if we get no further than talking about those things today and why the theoretical ecologists ought to be thinking about those things, I, I think we will have done it. Uh, Ramanan, why don't, why don't I go on to you and then um, back to Josh and Lona. Um, yeah, sorry to have joined late. So I don't know if, if some of this has already uh, been, been discussed, but um, you know, uh, just for, uh, 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 you, know, you know, back in March or April, um, uh, you know, one of India's virologists, lead virologist, and I wrote a piece in uh, Indian Pediatrics, which is the main journal uh, for the Pediatric Association, saying that, uh, you know, in the absence of the ability to really control the epidemic in India, which we thought was difficult given uh, the density of population, that a gradual acquisition of herd immunity was not a desirable outcome. I mean, it was not, was not meant to be an intended strategy, but it would be a unintended consequence of the way things were going. And by the time December rolled around, that transmission would have slowed down significantly because there, there would be pockets where there was significant amount of exposure already. Now, India has been through some severe lockdowns, but this seems to have come to pass, which is that uh, the positivity rates are now quite low. It hasn't, India has not seen you know, the, the large number of cases or the deaths in recent months compared to earlier in the epidemic. And, um, and age structure of population also makes a difference. So I think that what works in one country might not work in all countries because of, you know, again, age structure, which is if you have a lot of young people and uh, just for comparison, in India, there are about, uh, about six and a half percent of the population is above the age of 65. I believe that proportion for China is about 10 or 11 percent. That number for um, for the UK is about 18 percent, and that number for Italy is about 22 percent. So I think you know these discussions have to be tailored to what that age structure of the population really is. If you have a lot of young people who get the disease uh, but sort of act as a you know a buffer against the, the older folks getting it. Uh, which seems to have happened in many places in India, uh, perhaps you don't see the kind of rapid uh, number of deaths in the elderly population that, you, that you've seen in other places. That said, there are still other issues, which are that, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of one large uh, COVID epidemiology study that we'd published a couple, well, actually last month, uh, interestingly, uh, mortality rates are actually quite high in the age group from 40 to 70 in India. Uh, compared to most other countries where that mortality rate is actually highest in the 85 plus population for the most part. Now you have some sort of a selection effect where uh, people who have reached the age of 85 
you know, essentially because they made it there, they probably, you know, have fewer comorbidities. They didn't die earlier. So they're kind of tougher than the ones, uh, you know, compared to sort of in other countries. So compared to other countries, you know, compared to China, uh, Italy, Brazil, the US, India's above 85 mortality rate is actually the lowest, in fact. Uh, but it's highest in the 40 to 70 age group, probably because of undetected hypertension and diabetes, which are major risk factors. And in fact, uh, you know, all the COVID is an infectious disease. This, this comorbidity driving mortality is such an important effect. And I think, again, the answer to whether you go with, you know, acquisition of herd immunity or, you know, you try to shut down to make things happen, again, depends on the proportion of the population that is diabetic or hypertensive. In our study, we looked at about 5,700 deaths. I think about 64% had uh, at least one comorbidity and uh, something like 35%, if I remember right, had two comorbidities. So the comorbidity stuff is really quite important. And I think that and age structure together will really you know, be guiding principles for whether, you know, what sort of strategy one might want to adopt. I don't think there's sort of a universal idea here, um, which, uh, you know, in all conditions, you would do one or the other. Thank you. Josh, you had your hand up, and this is a very natural segue into things like in terms of shield populations that you've um, contributed a lot about. So I know you have thoughts on that, and that, that probably wasn't why you raised your hand before, but go ahead with whatever you want. Okay, well, I'll try to make a bridge, which is that I think one of the challenges you're talking, whether it's Great Barrington or even just how to interpret peaks has been one of the most challenging things in this whole epidemic. The timing of those may differ, but the temptation to assign or ascribe the mechanism of reaching a herd immunity threshold in these early peaks, I think has been deeply problematic. And Mercedes, I'm aware of that heterogeneity work. I think it's very good. We've also worked on some heterogeneity issues but the thing, going back to Scott's comment about behavior, is that it's clear that heter the herd immunity threshold depends not just on the fraction of individuals who may be immunologically naive, but also on the behavior of individuals. And I think people have misconflated those ideas. We've shown in a, in a paper that just came out that you can be aware of transmission, change behavior as a result of transmission, and get a peak that goes away and then come back as our awareness fades and especially if there's fatigue. So you can get more than one peak having nothing to do with crossing this herd immunity threshold. And I think that's been a big mistake for people to misinterpret. And heterogeneity, yes, it can be there, but we can also look at places like fishing boats. And that's a case where it's very hard to isolate, as you all know, and see 85% plus attack rates in a short period of time. So if we start to act as if we're on fishing boats, meaning going out and interacting in large groups, then it's going to be the case that we're going to see increases. And I don't have to go to the fishing boat. I can look at Greek houses here in the United States, including some on this campus, in which maybe not through fault of their own, but just the introduction of a case in dense living situations. And so I frame that only in the sense that I think that this notion of heterogeneity can exist, but also not necessarily be explanatory vis-a-vis -vis peaks. And the last thing I'll just, yeah. And then I'll, I'll wait. The shield immunity can be a different time. So well, uh, I, 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 I... I'm happy, happy to have you talk about the shield immunity, Josh. I just want to point out for this broad audience that when Josh talks about Greek houses, he means fraternity <laughs> houses. We're, yes, we're sorry, Greek. that's right. Internet, uh, fraternity, right. We call them Greek houses, right, fraternity and sorority. So we call them Greek houses, but dense live, learn environments on a campus. Sorry about that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Josh do, do, Josh, do comment on the, uh, on the shield immunity. I'll just make a brief comment because I, I see Mercedes and Lona wanted to say, so very, very, very briefly, only that from the outset, we have hoped that testing both for virus and for antibodies could be incorporated as part of response strategies. And the viral testing I think is obvious, but the antibody testing we viewed as very important insofar as I think there was a lot of evidence that this was not gonna be a seasonal beta coronavirus issue, that there was going to be protection. Now we can't know how far out, but many months at least, if not longer, and that individuals who might be seropositive might be able to take on additional roles, particularly in protecting those who might be vulnerable. And I think, again, we've missed multiple opportunities to go from imperfect but actionable informa information and avoid it for some reason to take action on with another cost, which is not leveraging that test information to act differently, to try to get more targeted. And in lieu of targeted responses, we're stuck 
with lockdowns, which we know have cost. So that's a brief summary. Lona. We have Possibly a comment don't know there. where to begin. We have had so many exciting things just thrown on the table and there's no time. So Scott, I think you'll be happy to know in Denmark, we actually have surveillance system of people's behavior. And this goes into the models that actually are used to figure out what's going to happen in the future and the forecast and all of this. So it's available in the public domain if you want to see, I'll send it to you. And Mercedes about the herd immunity, we have observed this. We've seen herd immunity in the Northern Amazonas in the in a in a town there, we've seen it in the Bergamo, Italy. For those of you who are in Italy, and we've seen it in the in the Mumbai three slum areas, where it seems to peak at sixty percent zero zero positives. It seems to be something around there, and probably this uh, heterogeneity we have with this uh, disease will will mean that it's it's definitely not going to be higher than that. Um, I also want to say that. Um, that it, one thing that's really important for us to mention in this conversation is that this, we looked at pandemics of influenza for a long time now. I, I looked myself for hundred years of worth of them. And this year is a totally different beast because it has this uh, over dispersion, this heterogeneity in the spread. And uh, together with colleagues at the Nielsen Institute, we actually have worked, used an agent-based model to incorporate this fact that only 10% of people spread most of the disease going forward. And, and we, are, we, just, we just so excited to, uh, that we think that actually the solution lies in controlling the, uh, this, the contacts in the public space. And there's a way to do that without really being able to pinpoint who is the super spreader. You can actually come the closest down. So for me, that's the one really exciting thing that has happened uh, during this whole pandemic is that understanding that flu is one thing, it's like a, a, a freight train, you can't stop it. But this one, you have a little button you can dial up and down if you can afford it. That has everything to do with this uh, over dispersion heterogeneity phenomenon. I just thought I would say that. Mercedes. Yes, so I, I agree. Josh, you brought a very important issue. I, I uh, didn't mean to say by herd immunity to turn around of the peaks. In fact, it's a complete misconception that the turnaround of these peaks, uh, of these first peaks had to do with herd immunity. Uh, I just meant uh, herd immunity estimated from these susceptibility molds is lower than, than in other estimates. Now in, in uh, response to, to what determines the peaks, uh, of course, there, there is uh, a very, an interaction between herd immunity and possibly seasonality due to policies and climate. And I think, we see this, of course, in diseases that you can say are SIR and very different from COVID because we know they are seasonally driven, something like dengue, where you get emergent serotypes lasting two or three peaks. And I think what determines the peaks is a very interesting interaction between uh, the, the, the transmission dynamics and the timing of this uh, of the changes in transmission due to due to seasonality, and I think uh, whether that seasonality comes through behavior and through a myriad factors that influence the virus, we will find that it plays a role here, and how it interacts uh, with policy uh, makes for a very confusing, unfortunately, a very difficult inferential aspect of this disease. Marino. Well, uh, you know, a comment on uh, heterogeneity. I don't know uh, what you, mean, you mean exactly by heterogeneity, <laughs> Mercedes, but we included heterogeneity in our first uh, uh, effort uh, uh, in Italy because the, the, the model that we conceived was actually uh, um, was space explicit. So we included 107 provinces in Italy and looking at the spread of the disease in Italy, it started in the north and then it went to the south. And then when uh, the crisis was considered over and people were allowed to, to go to the seaside, say in Sardinia and Sicily, it spread to Sardinia and Sicily. Now, you can actually uh, uh, calculate uh, and are not, which is are not, which includes uh, the uh, uh, geographical, at least uh, the uh, the mobility. Let's let's say. Then of course there are other heterogeneities, heterogeneity of behavior, uh, different age classes behave in a different way, uh, susceptibility in the different age classes and the different uh, 
uh, uh, say working environment is different and so on and so on. But after all, for all the studies around the world are not without any intervention is about three. Let me say that. It might be 3.5, might be 2.7, but anyway, everywhere, of course, uh, it might be different. In, uh, so uh, talking about herd immunity to me is ridiculous, let me say, because with uh, an R naught, which is about three, 3.5, 2.7, whatever you, you want, herd immunity is rich when about two thirds of the population has been infected. Now, two thirds of the population being infected means a lot of death, an incredible, an incredible amount. Okay, so we had results for the, uh, several seroprevalence studies. So in Italy around uh, uh, July 15, there was a, a sort of sample all over Italy. And, uh, you know, the seroprevalence in Lombardy, which was the, my region, uh, 7.5%, that's the highest in Italy. Other regions were 2.5%. So it means that, you know, uh, before reaching herd immunity, of course, there are some specific locations. So if you go, for instance, to uh, Bergamo, in, in, in a valley, they have 40% uh, uh, people be infected, okay. The second thing is that we already know that you can be reinfected. That this talking about, okay, I will cite you one case, for instance, that uh, you know there was a seminar by Antonella Viola uh, a few days ago, and they have seen in in, uh, in 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 Padua one guy who get infected, recover, then he was reinfected again and died. So it is. That's somehow clear that immunity, immunity might last just a few months. So this idea of reaching the herd immunity, let, let me say, I don't know it. Whether it does, I, I don't uh, know. I'd like to um, works. Let, let's let Lona because I think that's a controversial um, point about the, whether the individuals actually recovered and got. So Lona, could do, do, yeah. you're to close? Yeah, could you? I, I'm. I'm aware of this having occurred even one got more sick the second time than the other. But I think we can know for sure now that this is not very common. We see that, for example, in Bergamo, Italy right now, which was uh, had this terrific uh, uh, herd immunity in the first wave, it is faring very well in the second wave, opposite other towns in Northern Italy, which have had a very bad second wave. So that's just one of many lines of evidence. And I think that's, that's not gonna be an important one. Antibodies are okay. Even in Iceland, you can now travel in with an antibody passport. On this issue of super spreaders, by the way, you may have seen that this one Biogen meeting in Boston apparently was accounted for about 300,000 cases. So that's a, So I, I'd like to call on Daniel Fisher. I don't know, Daniel, whether you can uh, unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, Okay, go ahead. Yes, I can. Um, unmute. So I'm, I'm a theoretical physicist at Stanford, and my only direct relevance for this, having worked a little bit on, on spatial spread by um, long distance motion in abstract models. But I wanted to actually ask a question about homogeneity, not about um, a heterogeneity. So at, in the spring, if one looked at New York City, and you looked at all of the, the high density parts going all the way out to the rich low density suburbs, the variations in number of cases were not all that high. I mean, there were factors of two, maybe three in some cases, but not enormous. If you look in LA in the spring, they're again going from the higher density, poorer areas to the, the low density, richer ones. There was also um, not all that much uh, um, variability, but the whole area was much slower than, than New York. And I wonder if there are any thoughts as to what the, the explanations are of some of that. I think Josh made the, the comment that clearly in, in most places, at least, the number of lo the lost susceptibles was not playing a role and certainly not, not in those, I think in, in LA area there, but then what is it that can give rise to that level of homogeneity within regions? And anybody want to uh, respond to that? Hello? Uh, so Leha, uh, yes. Yeah, um, hi. yeah I'm anyway. also a theoretical physicist and uh, actually me and my students started to, um, you know, work on some models uh, since February because uh, things, you know, started in China and we were really, you know, wondering what's happening and whether things we can do 
make some models or inform the policy makers and so on. But uh, I mean, answering uh, Daniel's question, I mean, these early models, we just took the standard approach from epidemiological community and we'll mix and so on. And now people, of course, thinking about heterogeneity, but I think that probably is not really the most crucial issue. I think what Daniel asked, because after initially this uh, growth, exponential growth, there's some variability, maybe R0, uh, different places, somewhat different. But after some time, then you always see that it kind of level off at some, some value. And I think Daniel is asking which value, right? So uh, it's, it really has to do, I think the human factor is very important that uh, people you know, get scared and they take more precautions, whatever community they belong to. So that kind of bring down the growth and eventually you will reach like R0 equal to one or something. If you start to see the decline, sometimes you uh, have to overshoot a little bit, but then some kind of declining. But once people see this uh, declining, then they kind of tend to relax. But during this, this first wave, people still, they are very cautious, you know, they don't immediately relax. And that's what we see in Hong Kong, you know, we're actually now in the fourth wave. So I think this, um, the overall level is really has to do with the local community, how they are like worried, they, how much precaution they take themselves in addition to what the government is doing. So I think this kind of a self-imposed uh, kind of behavior changes that could, you know, at some point will bring down, because everyone now watching the news, right? So maybe the, they are seeing the, the increase or decrease more than the absolute value. And they kind of respond to the growth and, and not maybe instead of the, the absolute value. And so if the local community, they are, you know, take this kind of precaution earlier, then, then it will stop, it will level off at the lower level. So that's my kind of interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think the only reasonable interpretation is that there are, you know, rather long range um, behavioral changes. You respond most of things right nearby. You respond somewhat right, to right. things outside of the city because of you know, some amount of mixing that's within the true. city, yeah. but not enough to give you like a well mixed situation. And then you respond less to things in the whole country and, you know, less even to the whole the whole world. So I, I think it is something, but it's, you know, it's surprising that that gets you to some of these levels of of uh, homogeneity that, the, that there are, but I, and I agree, I think those things naturally give rise to sort of can give rise to dynamical um, to, to waves and things. Daniel, very quick comment. First of all, in Georgia, we saw imprints of heterogeneity that lasted a while. For example, in Albany, Georgia Southwest, there was a funeral that sparked an outbreak and that led to an imprint locally in that county and adjoining counties for quite some time that we would not have expected if we just assumed homogeneity. In New York City, there's strong relationships between socioeconomic levels and incidents. And in particular with the number of residents per household, Jeff Shaman, Michaela Martinez, and a few others have done these sorts of studies. So you see those factors, there's also relationship to ability not to take the subway. So there may have been you know, some gaps between awareness at the outset, but there are definitely, you know, let's say links between socioeconomic factors, mobility, crowding, uh, and, and incidents. So I, I'm just trying to add those layers into your comment yeah. about homogeneity. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, those all would give rise signals. to a lot of heterogeneities. And, you know, with changes in exponential growth rate, you expect all those things to be amplified. And so there has to be rather a big effect that sort of suppresses them to get the, the sort of lack of heterogeneities of in, uh, on some of the scales. But yeah, anyway, that's, it's enough on this, on this point. Well, let me turn to Ramanan now and then to Jurgen. Yeah, thanks, Simon. So, uh, you know, I, I teach a class uh, in Princeton where the main theme really is around this whole idea of, of people responding with behavior to, uh, to prevalence. And, uh, you know, there are lots of examples, of course, from HIV, which is in some sense a slightly more stable disease because people get to observe it and then, you know, get to respond to it in terms of, of their risk-taking behavior. I am not sure if if that has really panned out in the case of COVID uh, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, adapting to the prevalence out there requires having fairly good information about how bad things are out there. And I don't think the level of testing has been nearly enough in most countries 
to be able to support that kind of data. We know from zero prevalence studies that uh, you know, at least in some countries, we're picking up one out of every 20 cases or one out of every 30 cases. So we don't really have a good handle. And when I say we, even people who are studying this don't really have a good handle, let alone individuals. Individuals are responding to waves of panic on the media, you know, how many shows they watch, which are not necessarily correlated with, you know, what, what the true nature of the spread is, because there's been spread in lots of places where the testing has been wholly inadequate and therefore it isn't as if they're responding to something which is very rational. That's the first point. The second is that uh, just because it's a new disease, uh, I think people have been have found it quite difficult, at least for the first six months, to act to accurately calibrate their risk or risk taking behavior to the disease in a way that actually makes sense. What do I mean by that? It really means that for HIV, you knew it was sexually transmitted, so if you didn't have needle exchanges or you don't have, you know, blood transfusion or you weren't having unsafe sex, you were pretty safe. Here, people weren't clear whether to pick up the newspaper. They weren't clear whether to go play tennis or, you know, to go out of the park. So given that there was so much confusion about what risky behavior constituted and what was safe behavior, I'm not entirely convinced that for that long period, probably from March through to August or September, that people had any clue what they were doing or, you know, or if even governments had a clue about things that were actually problematic versus non-problematic. And I think, you know, some places get bars open, but shut down schools, you know, some places shut down schools and, you know, uh, sorry, kept schools open, but shut down the bars. I think there's a lot of confusion out there. And this sort of, uh, uh, you know, stable understanding What's driving these peaks up and then driving them down, uh, I think is a result of a lot of confused behavior rather than really of, of what I would call rational behavior, um, because it's all with fairly incomplete information. Very good. Jurgen, you had your hand up, I think. Um, can't hear anything from you, Jurgen. I'm muted. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Yes. No, I wanted to follow up on this with behavior that Scott was taking up. Uh, some little remarks that, you know, uh, from an e economic theory viewpoint, you, you think of individuals as being fully rational and selfish, and they take out in any information they can, and they can treat information uh, in, a, in a good statistical way, so they can make inference about things that they see about around them. And we know, of course, that that is a very poor model of real life human beings in many dimensions. One is the belief formation, and there can be these panicky situations uh, and things like that, but also the motivational part, I would say, so the, 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 the strict egotistic uh, you know, motivation, which is a classical economics motor of behavior uh, is not true, we know. And, and one situation when it's not true is when you have a public good situation in a small community of people who meet regularly over long times and so on. So we like in a village and a family, people do care for each other in another way then. And that can be explained by game theory and so on. So that's one thing. Another thing which is very important, uh, which has been added now uh, in, in economics to, to economic incentives are social incentives, social norms. But we are social animals and we care about what others think about us and our behavior. And that's very clear. And um, I think that the, this is not what has, this has not been used by some policy authorities. One could use this. Uh, I mean, when I think of smoking, the anti-smoking campaign was very successful because you can see and smell the smoke in a restaurant and people don't smoke. You don't need to have a policeman in every restaurant. People will frown upon those who go in there and smoke. You don't see the corona that I'm spreading perhaps when I go into a shop. But I'm now in Norway and in Norway, if you don't wear a mask, when you face mask, when you go in, people will frown upon you, even ask you to go out and so on. While in Sweden, they don't. So I think there is a social norm, but which could be used in a positive way that we have something common to think about and care for. Also to those who are not very close to us. And that is something I think is up to political leaders and or agencies to in, inspire that. And we also know from experiments that individuals, they are not purely selfish, not surprisingly. So there is a tendency in most humans to have some moral component that we would like to do things that we think are the good and right things. We have some tendency, not the very strong, is heterogeneity again. But if one inspires these, these things, uh, one can get much beyond what we have now. And this is something which I think we need to incorporate into the classical SIR models and so on, the, popula the population models in, in epidemiology, which are rather mechanical on the behavioral side. So I think we could combine here many fields uh, and you know, combine behavioral understanding and economics and game theory and, and these dynamics. 
and that will give a richer uh, model and possibly better ways to try to influence the, the uh, uh, control an, an epidemic, for example. Thank you. Very good. Marino. Uh, okay. Well, uh, you know, a comment. I think that, uh, you know, what has been working, um, like clearly heterogeneity is important, and heterogeneity in social behavior is important, and you see the difference. So, for instance, take Japan, and they had a very low uh, number of, of of people who died and they didn't go into a real lockdown like Italy, but lockdown in Italy worked. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, then uh, they, they re released the lockdown and then uh, after a while uh, we started again with, with the second uh, COVID wave. And now they went into lockdown again later than, uh, than you know, I, what I mean, I, I would have I would have implemented lockdown earlier, given what what was going on in Italy, and uh, and now the numbers are going down again. So uh, clearly, the 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 the, the uh, containment measures are are working, and well, you know the the homogeneity you 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 see now is clearly due to the uh, spatial uh, the the spatial diffusion of the disease so the 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 the, the, the spatial signature is clear with the the, the uh, covid starting uh, <laughs> in china then spreading the rest of the world uh, with the uh, mainly through uh, air travels and then going uh, to countries and then, so for instance, reaching Italy, and and, and of course, the, the fossa in Italy were in the northern part of Italy because it is the most industrialized part of Italy with a lot of the connection with the rest of the world. And then it went south when the, 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 the tourism season started, and so on and so on. Seasonality. Well, it is clear that uh, COVID is spread mainly when you are inside a uh, inside a, a, a closed environment, so clearly during summer uh, the contacts are not so close. Uh, and in fact, there is an interesting remark uh, that it, it went up in summer in Texas and Arizona because people want air conditioning, so they stay inside, and most of the of the contacts uh, are inside a closed environment. And it, it is very clear now that the main, that the main way that the disease is spread is the respiratory and close contacts and the aerosol and the, the droplets. So clearly seasonality is related to the effect and also is related to, to comorbidities because clearly during winter, respiratory uh, disease and ailments are, are more common. So uh, old people, uh, you know, might suffer from comorbidities, especially during winter. Uh, but I would say that, 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 that uh, lockdowns were the, the most uh, effective way of, of, uh, of uh, limiting the, uh, the disease. Uh, that, that's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, one uh, last quick comment from Scott, and then we have to tie things up. Right, so just very quickly, just to kind of echo, build on what Jorgen said, um, uh, I agree with everything. Uh, social norms can go in the two directions, of course. So there's a social norm to wear a mask. There's a social war, uh, norm not to wear a mask. And we're seeing both of those things. Um, there's another aspect to this, though, that I think is really important, and that is where people get their beliefs. And there's very strong evidence that beliefs, there's not only the normal variation, but that there's a correlation with people's ideological um, uh, identities. Uh, you see it very strongly in the United States, but I think it's also been in the UK and other places. Um, and this is really, I think, a, a real problem for us because, um, uh, because of the political connections and also uh, through so social media, it basically introduces uh, the ability of others to manipulate beliefs. And I feel like this is something that's happening on a pretty massive scale and it's making uh, 
pub, the normal kind of public health policies really difficult to implement. So we have the, the other problems mentioned before. Uh, Ramanan mentioned that we don't you know, get to observe prevalence. Um, uh, we also, um, people are, are transmitting without symptoms. There are all sorts of other complexities that are already there. We have all the normal richness of human behavior, but on top of that, we've got this um, uh, very um, disturbing um, uh, heterogeneity in populations in terms of their beliefs and where those beliefs are also being manipulated by others for political and other purposes. Thank you. So um, th this has been an incredibly rich discussion. We got almost through the first question I had laid out. Um, I, I hope that, the, first of all, I wanna thank all the panelists and, and, and uh, the others who chimed in. I hope this has convinced people of what I was arguing in my lecture on Monday, which is if we're gonna go forward to solve not just problems of this sort having to do with pandemics, but also climate change and other issues, we've got to um, have more sophisticated incorporation of economics and social uh, factors in human behaviors looking at things like social norms, pro-sociality, uh, political polarization, as Scott was just mentioning, uh, et cetera. So uh, we could have gone on for three hours on this, but uh, it's been a great discussion and, and thanks very much. We've got another um, panel discussion tomorrow uh, on economics more generally. So uh, and anybody, anybody, the panelists who wanna chime in and listen to that, I'm sure, just drop us a note and we'll make sure that, I think the same link will work though that you used today. Um, Matteo or Jacopo, what, Jacopo, what what time is that panel tomorrow? Uh, so it's uh, half past two. Uh, half past two, tomorrow. European, European time. So that's, uh, I guess, what, 8.30 uh, uh, in uh, the East Coast of the United States. Yes, yes. Okay, very good. Thank you all very much. Great discussion. Okay, thank you very much. The school uh, resumes tomorrow at 12. Uh, so have a nice uh, evening or day or uh, whatever. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Bye. Happy New Year.